Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, an unabashed atheist. And I'm Dan Barker. I'm also an unabashed atheist. In a moment, we'll introduce someone who was famous for coining the phrase, unabashed atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. And that person is Ron Reagan. Before we introduce Ron Reagan, we invite you to learn more about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this weekly TV show. FFRF is the nation's largest association of freethinkers working to keep religion out of government. Ask for a sample of our newspaper, Free Thought Today, or join us at FFRF.org. And now we're very pleased to introduce today's guest, Ron Reagan. He's, of course, the son of Nancy and President Ronald Reagan. He's had a dancing career, including at the Joffrey Ballet, and Ron has worked as a broadcast and print journalist and TV and radio commentator. And Ron's been a near lifelong atheist, and he's been interested in reason and in science. In 2004, Ron made a historic address to the Democratic National Convention on behalf of stem cell research, where he noted, But it does not follow that the theology of a few should be allowed to forestall the health and well-being of the many. The theology of the, flu, of the few should not forestall the health of the many. And Ron Reagan has most graciously endorsed the Freedom From Religion Foundation in a now famous TV ad that we will play. You will hear it during the break. Ron is joining us via satellite hookup from Seattle. So, Ron, welcome to Free Thought Matters. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it very much. I'm sorry you guys couldn't come out to Seattle, but under the circumstances, I think getting onto an airplane would probably be a mistake. So, Ron, I think many of our viewers will wonder how you became such an outspoken, unabashed atheist um, growing up in the family of Nancy and Ronald Reagan. Well, you know, you guys have been good enough to have me come and speak uh, a couple of times before the uh, the foundation, and you, and I, I always feel a little funny doing that because <clears throat> I've been an atheist all my life, and I didn't have to struggle with it, and you, I, and I never know quite what to say to you, <laughs> to, to the foundation, as you've probably gathered hearing me talk a couple of times. It seems to me that there are probably two different kinds of atheists. There are the atheists who, some of whom may even be clergy, who have really struggled with this and had a crisis of faith and, and it, it have, ha have taken steps along the way to, to go from faith to, to atheism. I, on the other hand, belong to this other group, which as, as children just decided, this isn't real, this, this can't possibly be true, and just sort of blew it off you know, from the get-go. I was probably 10 years old, I imagine, when I decided just internally that I, I didn't believe in a, in a, in a divine, in, in a presence uh, in the universe, didn't believe in the supernatural anymore. And that's, that's very easy for a child. You know, children are very binary. Children, something is either true or it is not. And at about the time that you discover that Santa Claus is not real, you begin wondering about God, at least many children do, I did. You know, it's another white guy with a beard who, you know, knows if you've been naughty or nice and has the power to punish or to, to reward, and he lives, you know, that way uh, in, in some, some direction. And, uh, and you discover that Santa Claus is a, is a figment of people's imagination. And then you begin to realize that other bearded guy, too, you know, that doesn't make any sense. So Santa Claus is the great enemy, as we know, of, of, of religious belief, I think. He undermines many children's religious beliefs. So I think you told us that you told your parents at about 10 or 12 that you weren't going to go to church anymore. And how did they react? At age 12, I, I finally decided I can't, you know, sit there in church anymore and, you know, and, and, and do this. It's hypocritical, among other things. And so I told, at age 12, I told my father, he came into the bedroom one day, on Sunday morning, we were going to pile into the car and head off to the Bel Air Presbyterian Church. And I said, uh, he came in and said, you know, get dressed, come on, get, put your suit on, we're going to church. And I said, I'm not going. 
And he didn't even hear that. That was so unthinkable to him that he just, he was heading out the door and he just over his shoulder said, you know, no, come on, get dressed, we're going. And I said, I called after him, I said, I'm not going. I'm, I'm done with that, I'm not going. And he was wise enough to not try and strong arm me into it. He just sort of let it go. They went to church, they came back, and then he tried to, you know, get into it with me, of course, and question me about this. And I was adamant that I was not going to, I did not believe what he believed. I thought it would be hypocritical for me to go. It would be disrespectful to his church, too, for me to sit there and pretend that I believed something that I did not. And so he... I don't know if I, I, I would say that he accepted this. Uh, he, he was very troubled by it, but, uh, but again, he knew not to try and force me to, to, uh, to go to church. He did eventually bring the pastor from the church, a fellow named Don Muma, who was the, the, uh, the preacher at the Bel Air Presbyterian Church. He, he arrived in my living room one afternoon. I came in from playing or running around doing whatever I was doing, and there was, there was Don Muma. And he was clearly there to try and convince me to come back to the church. And I thought, well, now I've got to deal with a professional here. <laughs> this is going to be a real challenge for me. But it didn't take but five or ten minutes before we'd, we'd stop talking about God and we're talking about UCLA football, which Don used to play. So, <laughs> And he later admitted to me, years later, how embarrassed he'd been by the whole thing. So, uh, yeah, he, he didn't succeed any more than my father did. I remember Don Muma. I was born and raised in Southern California. But when I was 10 years old, 12 years old, I was a true believer. I had, didn't have the courage or even the thought to, to criticize or to question. It took me into my 30s, and like you say, I was one of those clergy who eventually saw the light. But uh, when your dad was president, was there any other mm -hmm. pushback? Was there anybody else uh, who was, was critical of you or the family, or did, was that just under the radar? Well, when my father became president, of course, then you find yourself being interviewed by people uh, who are always looking for some sort of wedge to put between you and, you know, and the president, your, your father. And so um, I was being interviewed by the New York Times magazine, and an inevitable question that always comes up when you're in, in my circumstance is, well, are you going to get into politics? Are you going to run for office? And the answer is, has always been no. I, I have no interest in, in that. I'm not a politician. But that, that would rarely satisfy people, and so they'd keep pushing. So I thought, well, I know a way to end this discussion, this, this line of questioning. I said, no, I, I have no interest in that. And besides, I'm an atheist, so I couldn't be elected to any high office anyway. Okay, that, that did end that line of questioning, but people read this, and people, some of whom were friends of mine, very upset about this. I got letters from people, I got, you know, how could you say this? And it surprised me, I had to say, because I didn't really realize until then that people would care what anybody else believed. I didn't much care what people's religious beliefs were, unless they were somehow being imposed on me. Uh, so I didn't really assume that anybody would care that I didn't believe what they believed. But I found out differently. They do indeed. And I, I think that for religionists, atheism is such a, <laughs> such a troubling thing, not for the reasons they would, they would like you to believe, that they really, you know, they, they hate the sin but love the sinner, they want you to go to heaven with them and all of that sort of thing. I think it just undercuts their belief so effectively that they, they can't stand the atheist. Um, it, it, there, there's a psychology going on here, and I think it would be very useful for, for all of us, for all of our species, to understand the psychology of religious belief. Clearly, it, it helps in some way. It must have had some evolutionary advantage, probably for groups, that there was a cohesive story that they all told each other, and it bound them together. Otherwise, you know, evolution would have done away with religious belief by now. Nevertheless, it's, it's, it's not so useful now. We don't live in small tribes that are constantly being threatened by the, you know, people who live in the next valley over and who worship a different god. Um, <clears throat> that's not exactly what's happening now. We have, you know, we, we know a lot more than we used to. And, uh, you know, so I, I <laughs> there, there is a psychology, though, that where religionists feel very, very threatened by somebody's lack of belief, and they react very strongly to it, very harshly. But I think I know 
<clears throat> one reason, Ron, why there was a lot of attention when you said you were an atheist, because very few people, excuse me, <clears throat> were uh, coming out publicly as atheists. You were one of the more prominent people in the 80s, even in the 90s, who would make that unabashed statement. And that's how uh, you got our attention. And then, of course, when you gave that speech mm -hmm. before the Democratic National Convention mm -hmm. on stem cell research, and we showed an excerpt of that, I think it takes a lot of courage, what you've done. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't feel terribly brave uh, talking about uh, uh, about this kind of thing. It's just, hey, I, it's it's not even a belief, as you know. It, it's a lack of belief. You know, all all I'm saying is, a lot of people believe this certain thing. I see no evidence for it, and I don't believe things without evidence or reason. Um, you know, I, I don't believe in tooth fairies, I don't believe in the Easter Bunny, I don't believe in Santa Claus, and I don't believe in anybody's God. And I like to remind people that everybody is an atheist. You know, all the, you know, let's say most people in the United States uh, who are religionists are Christian. Okay, they don't believe in Allah, they don't believe in Baal, they don't believe in Thor, they don't believe in, in you know, Odin or anything like that. So everybody is an atheist. Everybody dismisses all the thousands of gods that have come before their god, and they just pick this one god that they want to believe in. I just go one god farther, like most atheists. Um, you know, that, that's, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, there's no more evidence for this particular god than there is for any of those other thousands of gods out there. You know, you show me evidence, I'll reconsider, but in the absence of evidence, I do not believe. So the obvious question then is if you don't believe in a God, how can you be a good person? You know, you can be a good person the way everybody else is a good person. All those holy books that have <laughs> some rather dubious ethical pronouncements in them, as well as some, as well as some decent ones. I mean, I think we can all agree, in, in, you know, uh, mostly that you should treat other people the way you'd like to be treated or not treat them the way you wouldn't like to be treated is probably a better way to, to, to put it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it, you know, you, we, 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 we all develop our own morality. People wrote those books, and at the time, in, in 2,000 years ago or so, you know, that was the state of the art of morality as far as those people knew, and so that's what they wrote down. Um, you know, they should have probably paid more attention to the Stoics and the Epicureans at the time, but they didn't. They went with the monotheism and, <laughs> and the Old Testament and all the rest of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, there, there's, yeah, what, what can I say? <laughs> you, you stated that atheists and non-believers do really have a duty to speak up, though. Well, I think you do, and I, I think, you know, if, if our species is going to survive, it has to move beyond superstition. You know, I don't believe in astrology either. And, you know, I don't care much if, if people do, uh, but I'd hate to think that they were directing society based on astrological principles. And so, you know, this, this is something we have to overcome. You mentioned the speech I gave in 2004 before the Democratic National Committee about stem cell research. I was concerned, of course, about stem cell research, but more broadly than that, I was concerned about the way that people who are often religionists, dismiss science as a whole. We see it now with climate change. You know, there are a lot of religious people who say, well, you know, climate change can't be happening. We can't be affecting the climate because, you know, God takes care of that, essentially. And God always changes the climate one way or, or, or the other. Well, you know, this is not science. You know, come on, people. We, we've got a crisis here we need to deal with, and we need to deal with it realistically, and we need to approach it with reason and not superstition. You know, th this, is, this is the problem. When, when somebody's private belief, which, you know, people will have their beliefs, we all do, but people's private beliefs find their way into public policy in a way that is really often very destructive. Um, you know, these religious freedom laws, for instance, that are, that are uh, being enacted in, in various states now. You know, why is it that religious freedom for these people always seems to involve the, you know, they're, they're the opportunity to be bigoted towards somebody else? You know, there, there was a story about a, uh, that may be somewhat illustrative, of a surgeon. And uh, 
Guy arrives at the hospital. His heart is failing. He's a heroin addict, and his heroin habit has destroyed his heart. They perform surgery. They report, repair his heart. Off he goes. A year later, he's back because, of course, he's c continued to use heroin. And the surgeon says, I don't want to perform surgery anymore here. I mean, this guy's just going to go out and he's going to use heroin again and he's going to be back here in another year and we're going to be doing this again. It's a waste of our, our time and our talent and, and money. So they took it to the hospital ethicist. And the hosp hospital ethicist point was, I understand why you wouldn't want to perform surgery on this individual. I might not want to perform surgery on him either, but then I didn't choose to become a surgeon. If you bake cakes for a living, if you bake wedding cakes for a living, stop worrying about who it is that's getting married here and just bake cakes. That's what you do. You chose to do this. You might not like all the couples that come in for a wedding cake. That's not your business. You just bake cakes. Bake the cakes. You know, stop worrying about whether they're a gay couple or not. What if they've been divorced? That would be another reason not to bake somebody's wedding cake, I guess, for, for some religionists. What if they were a mixed race couple? You could make a case based on the Bible that they shouldn't be getting married either. You know, so that this is just a road that you do not want to go down, but apparently a lot of these religionists do want to go down this road. So we have to take a break now, Ron. It's plain speaking like that is the reason why we awarded you the Emperor Has No Clothes Award for just telling it like it is. We're going to take a break, uh, but stay tuned. If you've never caught the commercial that our guest, Ron Reagan, so graciously recorded for us, it's coming right up in the break. And when we come back, we'll find out from Ron what the fallout has been for him uh, from that ad, and we'll talk about the censorship of this very commercial. My name is Jarvis and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. There are many reasons why I'm an atheist, but I'll start with the crudest explanation. I'm sure many of you have seen Clash of the Titans or The Immortals or 300, these blockbuster films about ancient Greek or Roman religion, which we now call mythology. But back then it wasn't mythology. It was very real for them. They genuinely believed that you had to put a coin in a person's mouth before they were buried so that they could pay for the literal ferry to the afterlife. Just as many people today believe that they should eat crackers and wine on a Sunday or that God wants women to hide their bodies under black burqas. Every religion that has ever existed, and there are many, have all believed that they were right, that their rituals and rules and beliefs were 100% correct. And they all thought they nailed it. But where are they today? Uh, if they're not completely forgotten, they're on the silver screen, amusing us with their sword fights, animal sacrifices, and oracles. The religions of today are the entertainment of tomorrow. Everyone, I hope, is an atheist about Zeus and Apollo, Juno and Poseidon. I just added Jesus and Muhammad to that list. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. You can find more content by the Freedom From Religion Foundation at our website ffrf.org. Follow FFRF on Facebook and you'll get notifications about all of our content, including whenever we go live on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. FFRF is also on YouTube, where all of our programs, including this show and our weekly news bites, are available to watch anytime. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the web. My name is Bill and I'm an out-of-the-closet apatheist, meaning I don't really care what you believe, and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served Mass a lot of Sundays twice. We, the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me, Alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended.
please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. And we're back with Free Thought Matters. We're talking with Ron Reagan via satellite hookup in Seattle. So, Ron, first of all, we're so grateful for you generously recording that TV commercial. And you've seen it a lot of times, like on the, during the debates and that. And some people said you were the star of the debate. Thank you for doing that and for helping to make FFRF a household name. <laughs> the ad has run on MSNBC, on Comedy Central, on CNN, getting a lot of traction. So from your point of view, I mean, we're hearing from a lot of viewers who love it, but from your point of view, what has the reaction to that ad been like? Uh, mostly positive. I, I, people come up to me on the street and tell me how much they like the ad. There has been some pushback, though. Uh, even people I, I've known have, have said that, well, you know, that seemed a little rude, particularly that last line, which is the one that got everybody so excited, the mm -hmm. idea of not afraid of burning in hell. You know, why did you have to say that? Isn't that offense? Weren't you trying to be offensive to, to people who are, are, you know, religious believers? The answer is no, I, I wasn't. We actually needed to pick up, <laughs> you, you probably know, we needed to add about three seconds to the copy. And, and so, you know, we kept recording it, recording it, it keep coming out 27 <laughs> seconds. And you know, the more you do it, the faster it gets. Anyway, so it was like, oh, we've got to, we just got to add some copy. And I said, let me just, I'll, I'll add a little to the end. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and that's what I came up with, not afraid of burning in hell, <laughs> which, which is true enough. I'm not afraid of burning in hell. And, uh, you know, and if there are any, uh, for instance, Christians watching, uh, watching the program now, I don't know how many would, but uh, if there were any, ask, your, ask yourself, if you're a Christian, if you're afraid of burning in a Muslim hell. I bet you're not. I bet you're not losing any sleep about that. And, I, and the Muslims aren't worried about burning in your hell either. And the Hindus aren't worried about burning in your hell. And you're not worried about burning in their multiple hells uh, also. So I just go one hell further. You know, it's like, the, it's like God. I go one God further. I go one hell further. I'm not afraid of your hell either. But this is very disturbing to people because hell gets right to the, the, the nub of, of things, doesn't it? Hell is the stick. Heaven is the carrot. Hell is the stick, and if you take the stick away, well, then the whole project kind of falls apart. And I think religionists instinctively know this. They have to make you scared of hell, or the whole project just falls apart. So Sorry. I feel that people who believe in hell have a very offensive belief and attitude. So I've been very shocked that national CBS, NBC, ABC, have censored the commercial because they don't like that last line. And it seems to me they're kind of blaming the victims. I mean, we're, we're not saying people mm -hmm. are going to suffer forever. They are. So why is this offensive? Well, thank you for saying that. Because it, indeed, what is more offensive? Me saying, I don't happen to believe in, in an eternal afterlife where I'm tortured, you know, with fire and, and, and what have you. Uh, or you insisting that that's where I'm going to end up. You know, you insisting that I'm going to burn in hell for all of eternity while, you know, presumably you, you know, stay upstairs and, and look down on me with some pleasure as you're sipping, you know, vintage champagne uh, or something. Yeah, that's pretty offensive. That's pretty damned offensive. You know, how about telling, how about the idea that children who didn't happen to be born into a Christian household are going to burn in hell for eternity if they die? That's deeply offensive. That's child abuse, frankly. If you're, if you're telling children that if they don't ascribe to your beliefs that they're going to be you know, roasting for eternity, tortured for eternity in hell, that's child abuse. That's emotional abuse. How dare you say that to a child? You know, uh, how, really, how, how weak are, is your belief system that you have to coerce children using fear tactics in order to get them to adopt your beliefs? That's just, it's pathetic, frankly. So as an atheist, though, how do you deal with the question about the fear of death? And we're not going to be here forever. We're going to die. And what happens after you die? Aren't you kind of afraid of that? 
Well, one of the alarming things is that there, there are specific ways in which it's alarming, the inter interference with women's health care, for instance, um, these freedom for, for religion uh, rules which allow people to you know, not serve customers in, in, in various places because they don't like their lack of religious belief, their lifestyles, uh, whatever. But religion, by its nature, most religions anyway, by their, by their very natures, are authoritarian. And you'll notice in, in many cases, perhaps all cases, when these questions arise, abortion would be the obvious, um, uh, the obvious case, there's only one side trying to tell the other side what to do. There's the mm -hmm. anti-abortion side, for instance, and there's the pro-choice side. The pro-choice side is simply saying, this is a question that we cannot legislate. This is something for an individual's conscience. You must decide this for yourself, and you are free to do so under most circumstances. Uh, there are some limitations, of course, which seem reasonable. Uh, but the religionist does, does not say that. They say, we know the answer, we know what is right, and you must ascribe to our beliefs around this. You cannot do this, or you must do that. It is not your choice. And those are two fundamentally different outlooks on, on life and, and humanity. So we're out of time, Ron. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your refreshing, tell it like it is attitude. And thanks for joining us on Free Thought Matters. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it very much. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.